The wetlands of Louisiana are spectacular. It's a region I adore. As a natural habitat and a fishing ground, they are truly precious. Without the wetlands, they say, there would be no Louisiana. Then earlier this year, a story swept the world, putting this paradise at risk and sparking a chain of events that threatened to impact on billions of people around the world. 11 people are missing after an explosion and fire at an oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico. Seven Thousands of gallons continue to pour into the Gulf of Mexico. A rate of more than 500,000 gallons. It says the oil slick in the Gulf of Mexico is now the biggest environmental disaster. 11 men were killed and 4.9 million barrels of oil ran into the ocean, threatening the wetlands and all who depend on them. As far as I'm concerned, BP is responsible for this horrific disaster and we will hold them fully accountable on behalf of the United States as well as the people and communities victimized by this tragedy. BP threw everything it had at the problem, but few people expected the success that was claimed just a few months later. There's news emerged that the bulk of the oil from the leak has either evaporated or been contained. Tonight, President Obama signaled the beginning of the end and confirmed that 75% of the escaped substance was no longer in the ocean. Four months after the disaster, I am back in Louisiana to find out how people have come through the crisis, how the wetlands and the wildlife have been affected, and whether it can possibly be true that the worst oil spill in American waters has just vanished. I think the weather's going to hold off, Stephen. Well, it looks um, reasonably good. It certainly looks good over there. I don't know which way we're going. I am joined on the journey by the zoologist Mark Carwardine. Mark is passionate, sceptical, and has little faith in big business and its capacity to take care of the environment. I wonder if this trip will change his mind. To begin with, to find out if the oil has really vanished, we are heading out to sea. There's no visible sign of any oil I can see. We fly across the wetlands and out over the Gulf of Mexico, and the stories appear to be true. Almost five million barrels of oil are nowhere to be seen. But there is plenty of evidence of the oil industry. I knew that there were lots of, uh, lots of platforms and uh, drilling rigs out here, but it, you somehow aren't prepared for the sight of it. There is nowhere you can rest your eye which doesn't fall on platforms, on ships flying between the platforms. It's like a kind of city of these Meccano constructions all planted in the sea. It's absolutely amazing. Gosh, it really brings home to me. The, the extreme nature of oil exploration and oil drilling these days. You know, most of the easy oil, easily accessible oil is gone. It's a very hostile environment, isn't it? And as oil becomes scarcer and scarcer, I suppose it will be more and more common for these kinds of environment to be used. And of course, the attendant risks of, uh, of leakage that, that, that come with them. Of the three and a half thousand platforms in the Gulf of Mexico, the ill-fated Deepwater Horizon oil rig was extreme. Way beyond these rigs, it stood 50 miles offshore in water almost a mile deep, tapping oil six miles beneath the ocean floor. Two days after the explosion, it sank to the bottom of the sea. Like drilling for oil in outer space. It looks pretty bad, that weather we're heading into, doesn't it? It does. We've been warned by the pilot that the weather in the Gulf can close in quickly and we should be ready to turn back at any time if things take a turn for the worse. I think we can turn round now. We're going to head right into the yeah, storm. Yeah, I think, think we'd better... Do you, do you want to have a look? Oh, my goodness, right there. That's, that's nasty. 
The great depth of Deepwater Horizon's well isn't the reason we see no oil on the surface. That is significantly down to a controversial but apparently effective strategy of adding almost two million gallons of a dispersant known as Corexit to the ocean near the well. Corexit is designed to break up oil slicks. Instead of floating on the surface, the oil mixes with the water, becoming suspended at depth in tiny droplets in the hope that it will disperse on the currents. Corexit is considered by some to be itself toxic in the environment and is illegal for use in most of Europe. Though there's no sign of oil from 500 feet, we want to talk to some people who walk the beaches of Louisiana every day to see if they feel that spraying dispersant has solved the problem. Grand Isle is a frontier town. It is located on a barrier island in the vast wetlands two hours south of New Orleans. The houses are built to survive the dramatic rise in sea level that accompanies the storms that frequently pummel the island. Life here is intertwined with the sea. Les and Barbara have lived in Grand Isle for many years. Les works for the state of Louisiana and as such gets reports every morning on the progress of BP's cleanup operation. What did it look like at the, the worst day you saw it? Did it, did it really oh, have was, big black yeah. blobs all it, over it? It wasn't it was, black, uh, it was kind of a rusty orange. Uh -huh. So you've been following this day by day? Oh, I've been yeah. here every day. I mean, it, do you think there'll be no more oil coming up now or is that the end of it? Or are you no, expecting I to think see more? more will come. We can't predict we that We can't yet. predict that. So but my I'm meeting sure this morning with the operations center at Lafourche over at, at Port Fouchon gave me a report that they picked up 9,000 bags of oil and waste yesterday on the beach and in the water. So how come we're being told that the oil's pretty much gone and that's the end well, of the problem? we would love to believe that, but we're not seeing the evidence of it here. We're not so it's possible that uh, this beach being clean, in two or three days there may be another influx, yeah. is that? Absolutely. Yes, that's, it's, it's continuous and it's, it's not predictable. We see. As, as long as we've it's seen it. with the tides. It, it's not as, oh, I can't even say it's not as intense as it's been because it's just so unpredictable. Now, I don't doubt a word that Barbara and Les told us, but Mark and I explore a mile or so of the shoreline without finding so much as a speck of oil. The next morning, I'm going through some of the latest scientific reports on the spill to see if there's any basis for the suggestion that oil is still washing ashore. Ah, oh, I say, beignets. You have a great day. Thank you so much. No one seems to be able to agree about this oil spill. The, the government, the Obama administration, has said that it's, um, you know, 90% uh, seems to have been uh, sorted out, or certainly 70% has been cleaned up. But uh, now we're getting other scientists saying, no, no, 90% of it's still down there. There's a chap here called Ian McDonald who's been studying the uh, Gulf for 30 years. He's an ocean scientist from Florida State. and. Uh, he, he's uh, accused the White House of making sweeping and largely unsupported claims. He says the imprint will be there in the Gulf of, of, of Mexico for the rest of my life. It's not gone. And he's warning about a tipping point from which the wildlife and ecosystem cannot recover. There are toxins, uh, the oil-based toxins, xylene and benzene, that you get in crude anyway, apparently. Uh, but there's also this stuff, Corexit, which is this dispersant, this agent that is used to, to break the crude up into micro droplets. And, and no one quite knows what the effect of that is. It's a very powerful chemical. Um, what does that do in the food chain? But it's the day's local paper that says that the respected Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution has found a plume of oil 22 miles across hanging beneath the surface. The earliest reports of the spill featured animals struggling through thick oil along the shoreline. That oil certainly seems to have gone, but a vast plume of oil somewhere in the depths will have effects that are much harder to detect. Hello. Hi. Hi. Welcome to the Institute Hi. for Marine Mammal Studies. Hello. Hi. 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 Hi
Dr. Connie Chevis has been receiving animals that seem to have been affected by a plume of oil. Come on into our treatment room. All right, let's get turtle number 57. Since the spill, a spate of endangered turtles have been turning up injured by fishing hooks. Incoming. I can take right. that. This is number 60. <laughs> so he came in with the two hooks that you saw in the x-rays. No. We took him to surgery yesterday and removed the two hooks. And now I'm wanting to evaluate um, to see what he looks like. See, but these are the surgery sites down here. Connie so is seeing is large numbers of turtles that have been caught on fishing lines, something that is very unusual and something that has greatly increased since the Deepwater Horizon spill. Normally, we get one to three a year that are caught on fishing lines, and uh -huh. right now we're up to uh, about 50 turtles. Um, could this be because they were moving from the oil? That's one possibility. And coming in closer and coming to shore And coming in closer to shore, yeah. right. Secondly, is it that the fish were moving from the oiled areas to the non-oiled areas? Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's a lot of factors involved, and we can't say, well, that's the answer. No. Uh, the whole scheme of thing is we've got to collect all the facts we can, and then we put everything together and rule out Whatever That's it science. can be ruled. That is science, exactly. Absolutely. Critically endangered Kemp's Ridley turtles are the smallest and rarest sea turtles on Earth. Once the hooks are removed, everything is done to give each individual the best possible chance of survival. It's exactly the same as a one you'd use for a baby. Don't you love it? That's great. It's still it? alive. Nice steady beat, that. It is. <laughs> but based on your experience the last six months or so, what's the prognosis for number 60 here? I think it's got a very good prognosis. Yeah? Yeah. OK, so is there a down. certain way of holding it? Just like this. Yeah. Yeah, there just you make go. sure you got a good grip. She's pretty slippery. Got it. It's quite heavy. All right, yes. Got it in the water. OK. Oops, sorry. This is our exercise pool. Uh, right, these turtles are going to be released soon, so go. we want to make sure they're conditioned to be able to to swim. Wow, oh, oh, look that's at that. Great. Jeez. Great. Look at that. You've done a good job with this one. Power. It counts her laps. Lovely. Yeah, they this, need isn't they it? need the exercise. Yeah. I'm really enjoying firm believer in conditioning and getting us in shape. We don't we don't throw somebody out to run a marathon without getting in shape. No, really. no, no, that's true. Or stop looking or at me when you survive in the wild. <laughs> Please stop I, I looking at me when you say, "Oh, you won't look at him too." Yeah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Isle is pelican country. The oil doused shape of the pelican became the symbol of the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Once endangered in the US, the state bird has bounced back in recent years but was hit hard by the worst of the oil spill. Even though the surface oil is no longer present, the smallest amount of submerged oil can cause a problem for birds that spend their day dipping into the water. We're traveling to some islands known to be key breeding sites for this iconic species, together with Tom McKenzie of the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Tom is still having to perform daily patrols to look for pelicans that may have swallowed oil. The booms, designed to keep the original slick from the nesting site, now double as fishing platforms for the birds. Do you know how many pelicans were, were, you know, uh, killed by the oil? Probably in the in the 3,000 range. Available. And is that is that a, the sort of number you might have expected? Or yeah, this whole operation, I've, I've gotten out of the prediction business. <laughs> you just can't tell. Everything has been uh, big you know, surprise. This has been one of the biggest ones, the longest one, the most expensive, the most expensive response, the largest personnel and equipment response we've ever done. Excuse the, me. Uh, catch the bird. At Queen Bess, at, we're waiting to catch a bird. At Queen Bess, oh, listen, Queen, isn't it? two four. This is one oh two. You got yeah, something? All right, gotcha. A patrol boat has reported a sick pelican that may have swallowed oil. Our boat is needed to get there quickly to chase the bird towards the net. That's our target bird, right there. 
All right, so what's going to happen now is we're going to act as a chase boat where we're going to herd the pelican towards the capture boat here. Right. So we just keep on going straight. You're going good. There you go. A little bit to your right there, Captain Lou. There you go. Yeah, I think it's this guy here. Huh. And pull up a little bit. Wow, that's been done before, hasn't it? Oh, 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 hold up. What's actually wrong with it? It, can't, it obviously can't fly, but it, I think there's a... You got him. You got him. Oh, well done. There you go. There well you go. done. That's fantastic. There you go. You really know what and they're the doing, The first thing they? he's doing, he's going to uh, control that beak. Yeah. Uh, because even if they're even if they are immobilized, they so have a very sharp beak. Powerful beak. Yeah. Not so much powerful, sharp. Right. They'll really? slash you. And I've oh, got really? one the, of our good end. friends is still sporting an eight-inch scar wow. on her arm from that. So we don't want people to try this at home. They control the head. Is this a typical reaction? It doesn't seem to be fighting back. They're they're weakened. They're so in they weakened just state. Go willingly. And it's it's like uh, and some of these are also very young birds. Plus, he's being very well handled, isn't he? They'd know exactly which places yeah, to hold him. Yeah, in. they're keeping it I'm in. I'm sure if Mark looking. and I tried to do it, <laughs> it'd be a different story. Thank, Thank you very much. Good luck. Good luck, little pelican. The birds are then handed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to a rehabilitation yeah, center run by birds. specialists in cleaning oiled birds, yeah, but funded here, entirely by BP. We call to arrange a visit and are offered a slot on one of a series of pre-arranged media tours. It's huge. What a huge facility. It's gigantic, isn't it? It is like an aircraft hangar. Yeah. There's a clean side and an oiled side. And we're not seeing... We are instructed right not to look into any crates or to stray away from the guide. This is not the kind of place that wins the confidence of people who feel like someone might have something to hide. All the effort. Look at it. So one person is basically holding the pelican's beak. And it is in a sudsy bath. Yeah, I mean, they basically use dilute detergent, washing up liquid. And the wash process will take anywhere from uh, a short time to 20 to 30 minutes, and then they're moved over to the rinse. It's like a sort of setup to you, sort of like a media to a one pelican all ready to go. It doesn't feel like a sort of... I don't know. To... I'm going to have to present the other side of the argument. I know you have a lot of doubts and a lot of worries about uh -huh. this thing. On the other hand, you always have to say, well, what if they did the opposite? I, I, I am super cynical, and I think my big problem is, you know, you look around, a lot of people come in and they just believe everything that they've been mm. told, and it will be fine in a few days and released, all happy, and everything's mm. all wonderful. And I do feel that, you know, that's a very simple and very naive message. And, yeah. you know, we need to look much deeper than that to actually find out more about what the reality of the situation is. Yes. I mean, the, the question there is, is, I suppose your real point, and I understand that, is who do you ask? Because the state and indeed the government seem to be, I mean, they understand that this thing won't get solved unless they persuade BP to put hundreds of millions in. And BP's going to exact a price for that. And one of the prices will be, you don't ask certain questions, I guess. We're ready to go. Thank you. It's a good example. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Of course, almost anything you can say about this crisis, you can say, well, they're all in the pay of BP, because in a sense they are, because BP has waded in with more money than you can possibly count. And I think what gets me is the fact that BP is very cleverly set everything up so that you know you can bring you can bring journalists and camera crews in and you know i was listening to some of the well whisper because there's some yeah. over there but some of the crews and people talking and they say isn't it wonderful <laughs> all these birds coming in and being cleaned and being released and what a fantastic job and i'm standing there thinking yeah but this is exactly what bp wants us to see and believe and you know the reality is behind the scenes is the vast majority of pelicans and gulls and terns, what have you, will never be seen. They'll have died a death out at sea and nobody will ever find them. I don't see what else BP could have done. By, by them not paying people, by them not throwing money at the problem, would that be better? But didn't you get a sense of sort of cloak and dagger? And I mean, I'm really cynical about it all. And then mm. on the surface, they're doing a great job and the individuals are doing yeah. a great job. But, you know, it's very stage managed. And yeah. there's no doubt at all the whole objective of this is to make people go away and show on television and show in newspapers that the problem's being solved and we don't need to worry anymore. <laughs> there may be only one way to settle this. 
I suggest we go back inside and put some of Mark's points directly to Jay Holcomb, our guide and the executive director of the International Bird Rescue Research Centre. You must have heard that yeah. the idea that BP is just basically buying up almost oh, yeah. everybody in the, in the... So they're stuffing their mouths with gold, as the phrase yeah, has yeah. it, so that you can't really speak against BP, you can't necessarily even criticise them. Does that worry you in a way? Because, after all, you must be angry. Um, well, it, it doesn't birds. worry me. I mean, it's just part of the reality. We yeah. did the Exxon Valdez spill and, and 21 years ago, and it was the same thing. And we were told that we sold out and all that stuff. Mm. The truth is, we're caring for the birds. There's nothing to hide. Yeah. They're oiled. We don't deny that. And we're <laughs> caring for them. It's simple, as far as my own personal opinions. I keep most of them private. And I, and I have to be honest with you, I've done this work a long time. Mm. So the truth is, until all the information's in, which would be years down the line, we were just doing an interview in the other room where they were asking us, well, how's it going to affect the environment? Well, I don't know. I mean, no. I've never seen dispersant dump like this before, and oil that they say is under the water. Mm. And so until that's really, until there's hard, solid facts, we don't know what it's going to do to the environment yeah. or the birds in the future. But you're reasonably confident about sending a clean bird back, that it's not going to get oiled again. Because there are these uh, talks of these enormous plumes. Yeah, under I'm not. I'm, I'm not particular. I'm not. I wouldn't say I was confident. I yeah. think that right now there's lots of birds out there that are clean, and there's fish available, yeah. and there's a clean, a clean environment as we yeah. know it. Yeah. Whether what happens in the future, I don't know. Yeah. But the uh, what the alternative would be to keep them. We yeah. can't do that. Yeah. So we have to take that risk. Yeah. I'm concerned that Mark is coming to the story with an overly suspicious view of oil companies. After all, it seems to me that while funding conservation might allow BP to control the press to some degree, it also allows the conservation to happen in the first place. As the day comes to an end, Mark explains why his view of the six global big oil companies is less than sympathetic. There's a handful of big oil companies, mm. and um, when it happens in other parts of the world, with some very specific examples, nobody gets to hear about it and nothing is done. I mean, in Nigeria, in the Niger Delta, where there's a lot of oil, in fact, 40% of all American crude oil imports come from Nigeria. Really? Um, they are spilling twice as much oil as was spilt in the whole Gulf oil spill every year what? in the Niger Delta. And people living there are they're drinking contaminated water. This is affecting millions of people. They're eating contaminated fish. They're farming on contaminated land. They're breathing in contaminated what? air. And had you heard about that? No, I'm I mean, embarrassed that, not but, to know about no, it. No, but nobody does know about it. And because it's in Africa, the rest of the world doesn't take anything like so much interest because this is in America. Oh, it's a really. big issue, and you know it's quite a smug attitude to, to make all this fuss and do all this cleaning and saying everything is going to be sorted and everyone will be put right. When actually, when they don't have to do that, and it's not just BP; it's all the big oil companies. They don't. Though BP were not responsible for that spill in Nigeria, here in America, they vowed things would be very different. So far, this cleanup has cost the company no less than seven billion pounds and counting. Everywhere you look, there are the signs of a cleanup in full swing. To get a sense of the scale of the operation, we accept an invitation from BP to visit one of the centers responsible for cleaning everything that comes into contact with oil at sea. And anything that gets oil on it has to come here, and it's phenomenal security. I think it's you'll like, find uh, it's called a Decon Forward Command Post. Oh, you got decon that right. That sounds is familiar. Decontamination. <laughs> it gives you an idea of the sort of military feel of it. Well, it's like it? trying to get into the White House. The, the yeah, uh, it's it's red tape passes, passes of passes, getting permission from this person and that person. Thank is that you. Is that going to fit? Almost That's not big enough. Hey, hey, <laughs> now, steady. You're right. Phew! <laughs> 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 <Oof. laughs> Sorry. I'll get my goggles on, hang on. Ah, I'm allergic to hard hats. Are you? Yeah. 
Actually, you know you were looking for a hat. Stop suits. it, you. <laughs> that That's it. not it. Thank you. <laughs> right. <laughs> With 45,000 square miles of fisheries still closed, this vast response will be in full swing for several months yet. This is a gigantic operation, isn't it? I mean, really, just the logistics of getting all this stuff in one place. And... How okay, many miles that. of booms were actually deployed altogether? Is there a figure for that? In Plaquemines Parish, we deployed about 550,000 feet. Over half a million feet. Half a million feet, feet down here alone. And that's well, just this type of hard boom. I've got an app for that. Is there somewhere that stores miles store, and miles of booms? They or is do it... store several, many, many miles of it throughout yeah. the country and for smaller oil spills. But with the scope and scale of this event, Manufacturers all over the state started manufacturing it for us. Really? 104 yeah. miles, anyway. 104 miles, just yeah. in this little parish. Just, just in, in this, this parish. Just in this parish. Wow. It feels strange to think that these seemingly insignificant black pieces of sludge are what this crisis is all about. And strange to think that what was once a highly prized commodity is ending up being scrubbed away as some of the most reviled dirt in America. That's the stuff we've been talking about, all the bits of actual crude oil stuck onto the boom there. That's been deep out to sea and it's been floating there and it's, it's accreted this. This is it. That's the irony, being the only oil we see is being cleaned off the booms that are, are solving mm. part of the solution to the problem. That is the big issue, it's out of sight, out of mind. Because mm. you can't just go to the sea and see a big slick, which no. would be very dramatic. It's not there, it's below the surface. It's um, hard to gauge how serious it all is. Yeah, that's the important point, is that it, because it's an underwater leak, um, it, it produces what they call a plume. But it's not like the slick that we're used to from, a, from the breached hull of a, of a carrier, which is, you know, a much more sort of easily seen sort of surface film yeah, of oil. Yeah, very different. And one of the things, of course, is you can look at a sea and you can't tell whether it's a thriving sea or a dead sea just by looking at the surface. We have just a handful of days in Louisiana. To make the most of our time, we're splitting up. Mark wants to find out more about this wonder chemical intended to disperse the oil. While I have come to see how local people feel about the resulting oil plume now hanging beneath the surface, out to sea. Hi, hey, Jeff. I'm Stephen. Jeff, Jeff. Nice to meet you, Jeff. A boat to somebody down here is your lifeblood. Without it, you've got nothing down there. Yeah, yeah. Whoa, uh, the bayou is a system of canals running through the wetlands. <laughs> you watch it. Hold on. Jeff is taking me to his favorite place, a scattering of houses, some largely built out of junk, on the edge of the bayou. They're amazing, these places. They're all different. They're all kind of eccentric. This is the remnants of a historic community. Though a few people still live here full time, most, like Jeff, just come here to fish, to hide away, and to enjoy the wetlands. Lovely looking shack. Nice camp! Lovely. Ah. Ooh! There you go. This is an amazing place, Jeff. I know this. This is important for you. You come out here when you can't. You're confident now that the oil's not going to get in here into the marsh, into the bayou. Mm -hmm. uh, we are going to get a hurricane or, or a big tropical storm in here. Uh, it could carry the oil as far in as, as the, the levees in New Orleans, depending mm -hmm. on how large of a storm it is. Uh, if the oil is suspended in the water column out there offshore, uh, either the storms are going to uh, stir it up and disperse it, mm -hmm. or it's going to draw it into shallower water forcing the oil up to the top and then driving the oil further inland. A great deal of oil may be out of sight, but it's still out there, which means for Jeff, the wetlands are not off the hook yet. For him, this isn't just a wilderness. 90% of all marine species in the Gulf depend on this environment at some point in their lives. I wouldn't trade this for anything in the world. It's the best place on Earth. It's the, the relationship that everything has with everything else here, uh, the animals, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the mammals that live in the, in the marshes uh, depend on the fish in the, in the bayous. 
Uh, the fish in the bayous depend on the shrimp. The shrimp depend on the plankton. If you lose one, you lose. You could. You have a possibility of losing them all. This is the nursery. This mm. is where everybody lays their eggs and does their breeding. Right. But Jeff's greatest concern is shared by a million people who might never even have visited this place. When hurricanes hit land, they quickly lose force. The city of New Orleans is close to the sea in a famously active hurricane belt. Though nothing will stop the worst storms, the wetlands are all that stands between the city and the brunt of the annual hurricane season. Scientists now know that if the wetlands are eroded, then a million people will be vulnerable to deadly and increasingly regular events like Hurricane Katrina. Five years ago today, Hurricane Katrina made landfall on the city of New Orleans. Tell them. Now we're going to bury some of these items here from the past. The list of excuses. And speaking of excuses, BP, we're going to put this in the box as well. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put her to rest. By chance, Mark is caught up in events marking the fifth anniversary of the hurricane. For the people of New Orleans, Hurricane Katrina is undoubtedly the most important event of the last century. It is a sign of the anger felt towards BP that the oil spill is now spoken of in the same breath. Mark has set out for the Louisiana State University to meet Professor Ed Overton, a leading authority on all aspects of the oil industry. Professor Overton is looking at the impact of the dispersant corrects it on oil and the environment. What you're doing is you're trading impacts off. You're saying more impacts offshore versus less impacts onshore when you disperse oil. Was that a good idea? We don't know yet. It's a catch-22. Do you it's, risk it's, the shore or do you risk the that, open that's ocean? That's right. I, I tell everybody that dispersant use is a horrible idea. The only thing that might be more horrible is not using it and letting that oil yeah. come ashore. So yeah. you just got to hold your nose and make a, a guess. And it is a guess. It's an estimate. Yeah. So that, and the that, trouble is, we don't, we'll never know, because it, no. th that's one of those hypothetical questions. Professor Overton is conducting experiments on the effectiveness of dispersants. The results may help determine the wisdom of adding dispersants to future spills but they will be too late for the spill that has just taken place in the Gulf. It seems to me quite outrageous that we don't know what impact the oil is going to have. It, don't you think that's something we should have been researching before and have all these answers ready for a, a spill like this? Absolutely. It's unbelievable that we didn't know that. And what's even more unbelievable is that offshore royalties from the production of oil in these areas is the second largest source of income to the United States government after income tax. And all, Almost some of that, but almost none of that was used to understand the implications of drilling in deep water. It's just unbelievable. And, and, the, and the companies that were asking for the permits should have equally been prepared. It just wasn't done. Everyone had a sense of complacency. They thought the engineering solutions would prevent this kind of spill. That blowout preventer was so heavily engineered that it had to work. It was just like the Titanic. It wasn't going to sink. Well, we know the Titanic is on the bottom, and we now know that that blowout preventer didn't work. The last great oil spill to grab the front pages was the Exxon Valdez spill, in which over 260,000 barrels of crude oil entered the ocean on the 24th of March, 1989. Though it was the ecological disaster that grabbed the headlines, we now know that the way it was dealt with only served to compound the misery for many people caught up in it. 21 years later, fishermen claim the company has still not paid the full amount awarded by the courts to those affected. Clean up that oil. See y'all later. From the outset, BP promised that this time things would be very different. Jeff is taking me to see one of his neighbors. 
<laughs> Unusual name. <laughs> James Phillips is a shrimp fisherman who can't make a cent unless the fishing grounds are declared safe and reopened. But he isn't complaining. Right, I'm I'm Stephen. Nice to meet you. So, how do you earn a living in the me how in do you the meantime? Yeah. Well, um, uh, BP, you know, the, uh, they send us a little check every month, you know, uh, for us to keep us going till they open this up. Right. Yeah, they, they, they do, they're doing that. Would you say then that uh, BP have handled this crisis well and satisfactorily? Uh, on my end, and you know, uh, you know, as far as fishermen, you know, uh, to me, you know, they did pretty good. I, I have no complaint, you know. Uh, yeah. I can't speak for all the rest of them, you know. No, I understand. Yeah. And are you being used in the cleanup operation? Yes, sir. Uh huh. Yeah, they, they use us to clean up, to go clean up. So when you're not fishing, you're being paid to help with the cleanup. Right, right. No, they they're paying us boat ways. Uh, they hire the boat to to go clean up. Oh, right. And they also just pay us on the side for for, for not fishing. Oh. oh, there we go. Oh. I got I got a few crabs. Though James can't sell his catch, he is allowed to catch food for his family. Being compensated both for the use of his boat and for loss of earnings, it may be true to say that James and his family have never had it so good. Thank you, James. Good luck. At its height, BP were receiving one and a half thousand claims every day for compensation against loss of earnings, and they have paid out over $300 million to date. Though most of the claims came from fishermen, some also came from waitresses, dock workers, electricians, and one was from the Mimosa Dancing Girls strip joint, claiming that fishermen could no longer afford to frequent the club. Back in New Orleans, Mark is meeting Mike Ellis, a boatman who received compensation for loss of earnings, but was also asked to take his boat through the slick in search of contaminated wildlife. I did that until I blew my engines up by running through the oil. Really, there was that much oil on the surface? Oh, it was nasty. One day you'd go out there and as far as you could see would be just oil. I mean, you could not see open water. The engine stopped working. What happened then? I had to... Uh, I had to take it and get it repaired. Um, Which they paid for, presumably. No, they still haven't paid for that. Really? I'm still out. I mean, I had to put another set of engines at $40,000. Really? It completely destroyed com the engine? Yes. Mm -hmm. So what did they get you doing then? Whatever whatever they needed. You're seeing what, you're seeing what you do, and the only thing that you know, destroyed. Yeah. And you're forced to put on a smile and basically chauffeur the people around that caused you all this trouble. You can't come in and destroy all of my stuff, all of my friends' stuff. Everyone I know fishes. You can't come in and destroy our world and expect us just to be all happy and cheerful about it. Everything I do and everything I have done is now wasted. I've got so much money invested. I've got a house down there. I've got a 200 something thousand dollar boat. And it's all wasted now. All of the last seven years is gone, down the drain. They've taken all of that from me. And they're having such a big impact on your wife and kids as well, indirectly. Yeah, it's really, obviously really upsetting you. Is it because you feel so helpless? Well, that's the part you don't like. You know, when your wife calls you crying. Or you've got to pay bills, so you've got to take money out of your child's savings account. To Is pay that the what you've had to do? Mm -hmm. Things are that desperate. Yeah. You know, I can be mad at them and everything like that and despise them. That's, you know, I can deal with that. But when I've got to take for my daughter, Though the surface is clear, it is the plume beneath the surface that now prevents Mike from deep sea fishing, and nobody can predict how long that will remain. No two oil spills are alike. Nevertheless, in the Exxon Valdez spill, many species were hit and the environmental impact continued for many years. The oil entered the food chain, and two decades after the spill, the local whale population is still in decline. 
A team from the University of North Carolina estimates that it may take yet another 10 years until the Arctic habitat is fully recovered. Les and Barbara, the people we met in Grand Isle, have called us to say that the local crab fishing grounds have been reopened just four months after the spill, and they invited us to celebrate with them at a crab party. Walk is my land. I cleared ten acres in a house I built into the side of the hill. At the party, I meet Dr. Shirley Lasker, a sociologist who has been working with the coastal communities since the spill. She has recently returned from taking a group of local fishermen to Alaska to meet people affected by the Exxon Valdez spill 20 years ago. When we were in Alaska recently, the recommendation was to go on, live your life, do not be dependent on your recovery from the organizations, be they the government or the, the business that, yes. that has caused it. Don't characterize yourself as a victim, in other words. That's correct. Yeah. And also there was the issue of forgiveness. Yeah. Um, do you forgive but still make sure that the resources are there for the domestic violence, for the corrosive community when the arguments start as to who's at fault? Are you saying that you can lay out the door of a corporation domestic violence, that, that it follows as the night, the day, that Absolutely. if a corporation lets people down, a man will naturally raise his hand to his wife? Because you have a situation in which the income of that family has been stopped or is uncertain, yeah. and when the fishers stop doing the booming on the oil, they really truly will be out of work. Yeah, and therefore it's perfectly natural to hit the wife. And therefore, under stress, it is possible, and we found, remember, right. this is our second catastrophe. We're, yeah. we're old hands at this. Yeah. <laughs> This What's is the this? first oil that was collected from the beach. Really? Uh, I saw it in the kitchen. I thought it was homemade <laughs> chutney. <laughs> it does look like chutney, but make sure you don't get it on you because they say it's very toxic. This whole thing was not BP's fault. It's not. It's my fault. It's Betsy's fault. It's your fault. Yeah, it's your fault. It's yours. It's your fault. It's all, it's all of our fault because we demand, we've become hopelessly dependent yeah, on yeah. petrol, yeah. oil. Yeah. Yeah. Look, BP made a mistake and they're paying for it and they're bending over backwards. I want to say it to the world that, you know, they're doing a great job, you know, yeah. of tapping that well and making it right. Take one. Oh, we got crab. Oh, oh my goodness. Mm. Do I just grab one? Mm -hmm. Wow. So I've got a yeah. guinea pig here. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. the government yeah. says they're safe. We're all yeah. going to watch yeah. you. Okay. Which See, are the bits I can eat? Crab. <laughs> Take it. Oh, I can eat that. Yeah, you can peel that, that shell back. You know, it's like eating birds. Oh, Chicken. that is delicious. Okay. You, I have you, to say. Yeah. I, I, you get far out. be it from me to criticize nature, but there's a, there's a lot more packaging than product, isn't there? Yeah. Crack it. All right. Oh, oh that? that is good. All right, you see it? Two weeks ago, I couldn't have eaten this because the government deemed it to be unsafe. This week, it is apparently safe. Uh, if tomorrow morning I'm found heaving my guts up somewhere, um, we'll know the government was a little premature, but I'd say it tastes very good. The only constant thing on this trip is that we keep running into paradoxes and contradictions, which perhaps should not be surprising in remote, nostalgic seaside communities who have come to depend on the giants of a global industry. South Louisiana, at the end of Highway 1 My daddy took me fishing Grand Isle when I was young and I can't remember all the fish I caught that day Cause all that I could think about was the one that got away The following day, Mark is up early. He's been trying to contact some researchers looking into the effects of the oil plume out in the deep ocean. He's had a call telling him that they're currently undertaking further studies on board the Greenpeace ship a few miles off the coast. 
I don't know if it was the early start, the forecast of violent storms at sea, or the fear of the crabs rebelling, but I decided that this visit was something Mark needed to do alone. Made it okay, helicopter got here, strapped safely on the rear deck back there. But look behind it, this most horrendous storm just following us around. We're going to go out on a boat with a whale researcher who's looking into the impact of the oil on the cetaceans in the Gulf of Mexico, and we are going to get absolutely soaked. Do I hold on to this? Okay. Sue Rocker is a biologist from the Whale and Dolphin Conservation Society. What are you actually trying to um, find out while you're here? What's the research focusing on? Well, nobody really knows what the effects of the oil and the corrects it are on marine mammals. The... That seems extraordinary. Isn't it? There was, after the spill, in the, the Exxon Valdez spill, the two po orca whale populations decreased by 33 to 40 percent, respectively. So, I mean, given that, there might be quite an effect, but it depends on ex length of exposure to oil. So what we're trying to do is we're looking for skinny individuals, individuals whose prey source has been affected. So you have to get close to the whales and you look through binoculars and right. then you just judge according to a healthy looking whale. Right, well, that's why we're on these little boats because we do need to get close to them yeah. to photograph them, to get skin lesions, uh, particularly, you know, around the blowhole, the eye, those mucousy areas. And what does that indicate? Is that just not getting enough food, or is that? Well, no, those would be, sick? yeah, those would be long-term exposure to oil, or corrects it, dispersed since yeah. big wave. Everyone's okay. Yeah. Turn to the ship. I'll tell you when. Copy that, loud and clear. Okay, so we have a go ahead, return now, Phil. Return now. On our way back. We have a water spout. Uh, just on the starboard side of the Arctic sunrise, just touched down. Yes. The water spout, that's yep. serious. So uh, everybody secure, hold on, we're okay. going home. Do you want us down? Yes, please. Yeah. Both down, let's go. weather has put paid to whale hunting, one job that can be conducted in any weather is trawling for some of the smallest but most revealing creatures in the Gulf of Mexico. Bridge, bridge, this is poop deck. Uh, we're standing by. Erin Gray is a researcher from Tulane University and is gathering the minuscule lava of blue crabs. And then just let it go? Yep. These lowest specks in the complex food web are said to be keystone species that reveal the impact of oil on the least understood ecosystems out at sea. Acquired the specimens, Erin will take them back to shore for analysis under an electron microscope. That's a good haul, is it? Yeah, that's a pretty good haul. As we're comparing samples that we've taken from near the deep water horizon wellhead 
to samples we've taken far away to try to compare those larvae and see if they look uh, different. And what sort of things have you been seeing? Have you seen any sign of any damage to them? Uh, we've seen um, some weird orange droplets inside the megalope samples from Grand Isle and a couple of places near um, the oil spill site. Orange droplets, you mean like little orange bubble yes, type things? Yes, little orange or... bubbles inside here. Actually inside the, the animals? Yes. Has that been seen before? Uh, no, actually, we haven't ever seen these orange droplets inside the, the megalope before, so that's why we're working pretty hard to figure out what it is. So logic would suggest that's got something to do with the oil, if it's the first time they've been seen? Yes. So what sort of impact might it have on the ocean uh, in the Gulf? It's going to have a huge impact. First off, there's billions of crab larvae out there, and secondly, everything eats them. Everything from redfish to spotted sea trout to other blue crabs will eat crab larvae. So if, if the oil has had a big impact on the plankton, then we're likely to see that impact spreading throughout the whole ecosystem and, and probably for years to come. Yes, I believe so. BP had a hand in a disastrous accident. But the more we have travelled through Louisiana, the more Mark and I have disagreed about what we have found. He has become increasingly entrenched, and I have been equally persuaded by very different views. In a final attempt to resolve things, we have a chance to take this to the top. And first, let me simply say I would like to, to genuinely thank the Schwester. Mike Utzler is the chief operating officer of BP's Gulf Coast Restoration. He's giving one of BP's regular press conferences on the status of the cleanup and we have been promised a few moments with him at the end. Hello, Hello. nice to meet you, Stephen Fry. Steve, Mike Hustler. Again. Nice to meet you, Mike, and thanks for seeing us. I'm sorry, Mark, I had, this, I had this sweat spill. Um, which... Not a problem, <laughs> I understand how this works, believe me. Yeah, it's very Hello, nice of you to talk to us anyway. Oh, it's my pleasure. It seems that it was, it was quite premature a few weeks ago to make the announcement that the, uh, the vast majority of the oil has actually gone and, and disappeared. Would you, would you agree that that... That was a bit premature. We don't actually know whether the oil has gone or not. You know, the science that has been put into estimating what the oil, how much oil was spilled and how much oil has been recovered is a continuation. It's an estimate. And it's a series of estimates that will become refined as science continues to be refined. And I mean, there's some recent research from, for example, the University of South Florida suggesting a lot of the crude oil has sunk right down to the depths where it's very difficult to detect it at all. How will we ever know how much oil is either very deep or actually settling down on the bottom? Well, there's a massive research effort that's actually looking at the water column from the seafloor uh, at, at beyond 5,000 feet uh, all the way through to the surface. And do we know what proportion of the oil is there then? We don't at this point in time, but what we do know is well, that it's, the, rapidly the state... it's, it's rapidly biodegrading. Sorry to interrupt, but the statement a few weeks ago did say that three quarters of it had gone. Right. So, but we don't know that for sure. We're, we, we know, we, we can estimate based upon that scientific data and that understanding as it continues to mature that the vast majority of this that wasn't captured mechanically, that wasn't evaporated and dispersed, was then spread into the water column. The plume is actually disappearing. The plume is being biodegraded, that there is a new form of microbiology that is, is attacking this plume and using it as a food source. Just to bring it back to the... Sorry, nice oh. schedule here. Appreciate okay. It, right? you get Thank you. I have well, no, no, I really, <laughs> really? could go on forever, but it's very <laughs> kind of you. Thanks for very your time. Kind. Thank you. I, Thank I, you I so much. I understand you're one of the busiest men on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, care, thanks. we appreciate it. Thanks. Absolutely. <laughs> there was so much I wanted to ask him. I was, I was just exploding with frustration. And he's so very finish good. it off, he's, he's got the he's right answers. But, you yeah. know, the next question was. You know, OK, that's all very well. It's sort of about clearing what you can see, but it's what you can't see. One of the big questions is, what, what are they doing about the dispersant they use? But, I mean, uh, listen, let's be honest, this guy doesn't think of himself as a villain. He's desperately trying to do the right thing by his company and therefore... And he knows that to do the right thing by his company, he's got to do the right thing uh, by public opinion. The public opinion won't buy anything other than what is seen to be a massive investment and commitment. <coughs> of he course knows that. that. And so, I, you know, I don't think he goes home and says, ha-ha, I fooled the public. No, I'm not, you know, I don't he, think that at all, but it's, it's yeah. a brilliant PR exercise. And what's actually below the surface, physically and metaphorically, is what really upsets me. When you, when you say you can't believe it, did you seriously imagine that any other outcome than this? No, the good thing is that um, he did accept that that statement that was made publicly and was in all the press just a couple of weeks yeah. ago, that three quarters of the oil is gone, did at least say, that's, yeah. we don't know, that's not necessarily yeah. true. Yeah. 
more complicated than BP are simply died in the war villains who are trying to obscure what they're doing. It's more complicated than that they're oh, just good guys doing a proper job. It's, I'm afraid. it's human shaped. It's not, you know, it's 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 not fiction shaped. It's uh, it's got all the messiness of a real crisis, and that's a mixture of incompetence, courage, failure. You know, stupidity, brilliance, all these things come together in, 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 in the way that they always do with human beings. Um, and, but I uh, still believe the oil companies are the villains to a large degree. So little on this journey has been straightforward. Easy cliches have given way to the complexities of a real-life crisis. The images we expected were replaced with something trickier, harder to digest. It would have been convenient to have found heroes and villains, tragedies and happy endings, but it didn't work out like that. Not for me, anyway. In the end, this isn't the film I imagined Mark and I would make. I imagine coming over here and talking to him and uh, finding a common ground on which we could assault the, the supervillain, the Bond villain that is uh, BP and uh, global capital and uh, the exploitation of the world. And of course, it's very easy and very tempting to do that. There's no question that uh, uh, we, you know, these companies um, are doing quite grave things to environments. On the other hand, these companies are super rich because all of us buy their product, myself included. I came here by plane and then by car. I go everywhere by plane and car. Let's face it, it's, if not an intractable problem, it's a deeply complex one, and we're all mired in it. And it's a bit of a cop-out to blame one company for being somehow responsible for offloading our own guilt, if you like, onto one corporation. I feel really, really strongly that big oil companies like BP and Shell are hugely to blame. They're big companies. All they're interested in is making profit. They don't seem to have any responsibilities. They talk clean, but they act dirty. And, you know, this is a very good example here in the Gulf of Mexico, where when the blowout happened, it took months to find a solution. And my feeling is they shouldn't be able to do that kind of drilling, that frontier on the edge drilling for oil, unless they have solutions to hand. Whether the blame lies at the door of huge corporations or everyone who ever set foot in a car, there is one thing we do agree on. There is a price to be paid for this tragedy. 80 years ago, the first offshore rig had yet to begin drawing oil. And according to current estimates, in 80 years' time, the last drop of oil will have been drawn from the ground. We live at a historical fulcrum, the height of the oil boom. We live richly on it, without fully understanding the costs it imposes. We will have to hope that the future will not judge us too harshly for that. <laughs>